Hello everyone, this is On Tyranny, the radio branch of Ancient Greece Revisited. You can find us on YouTube, where we make short documentaries on Ancient Greece, trying to rediscover what we consider the inceptual, uh, the original meaning behind this great civilization. We're two modern Greeks, try to um, take the thread back to our past, and in the process we've been discovering great things, and as of this new crisis that has befallen the world, this global pandemic, a pandemic of mismanagement, one might say as at least as much as a pandemic of illness. And it would be a shame if we could not apply what we've been learning and apply the political philosophy of ancient Greece into our current state. So, without further ado, I decided to invite someone who knows a few things about Plato's political philosophy and try to apply it to this modern, seemingly medical, but perhaps much deeper political for sure, and maybe even spiritual crisis as of this pandemic. So I welcome Professor Spiridon Rangos from the University of Patras, Professor of Philosophy in the, in the Department of Literature. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. And for for people listening, we this will be our second interview. We had a great interview uh, face to face on our main channel, Ancient Greece Revisited, on the goddess Artemis, and we went into some some depth on this goddess. And you are one of the experts on this goddess. You did your PhD on Artemis in the University of Oxford. So whoever's listening... Cambridge, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cambridge, sorry, sorry, Cambridge. Um, it's all English to me. And so whoever's interested in this goddess, um, I, I felt it was a very, very good interview and we went into some, some depth on this half-neglected uh, goddess. Uh, but now we're going to take a tack and try to use Plato's philosophy and Plato's understanding of health, medicine and politics into this global pandemic okay and we decided to read a very interesting paper that i'm going to paste the link below um, it's available for free on jstor that sums up some of plato's views and i think it was called the medicalization of health which is a very interesting uh top a very interesting way to start the discussion the difference between between medicine and health. Yes, uh, which is in a way the difference between the means and the end. Uh, the, the, the difference uh, between how we achieve something uh, and uh, what it is that which we want to achieve. So uh, th th this paper um, stresses... Yes, a, a lot of Plato's views. And it's interesting how it, it ended up with, um, you know, it had two or three sub-chapters, let's say. It's a short paper. It's about, I guess, 15 pages, uh, 19 pages, I think. And um, it, it was, uh, let's say, subdivided in three chapters. And the last was called something like uh, li um, Medicine in the Liberal State. And it's very interesting because as we've been rediscovering Greece... Uh, we've been rediscovering, in a certain sense, the original criticism of liberalism, a, a liberalism that is very different today than what it used to be in Plato's times. But a lot of similarities can be found. And today, living in what we call uh, the liberal democracies of the West, whether be it Greece or France or England or the United States, it doesn't matter on a deeper level we have a suspicion of ends we have a suspicion of politics trying to define the ends the goals the ultimate goals of life but this was not so in ancient greece that's right you're right you're right uh, so uh yes uh, uh politics has become uh, a kind of uh, management and uh, the ends uh, are never discussed. I mean, ends such as um, 
the, 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 the good of the human life, or the good life, or uh, uh, what the, the, the ancients, the Greeks, uh, called uh, uh, eudaimonia. Uh, there's, there's no public discussion about, about, uh, about this, and uh, we take it for granted that uh, material well-being and um, consumerism are, are values because they are promoted. Uh, as such, but uh, as you said, um, we as a species of people, um, politicians especially, uh, if they have a view about uh, how uh, human life should be led uh, and uh, what, what, which are the ends that um, uh, human beings should achieve and so on. Uh, but this actually was not the case in, in, in Greece. On the contrary, politics, both in Plato and in Aristotle, was supposed to be the master science. Um, uh, Aristotle calls it uh, architectonic in the sense that as the um, archi as the architect is the mastermind about the building, the temple, a house, whatever, and all the other um, workers are subordinate to his main vision. Uh, so is politics with respect to a particular arts and crafts in a city. So, and medicine is one of them. And um, it is interesting that, um, uh, although you mentioned Plato, I would um, uh, mention Aristotle at, uh, in this, at this juncture and say that the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics says that um, there are different crafts, uh, uh, each one having a particular end, and uh, different crafts are subordinate to superordinate uh, crafts, and the master craft of them all is uh, politics, because um, the, 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 the craft of, um, um, of the shipbuilder, for instance, um, has as an end the building of a ship. Um, Military craft, the, the craft of the general, um, has as an end victory. Um, the economic craft has as an end wealth. But why we should build the ship and That's win right. the battle and fight the war is politics that defines Okay, precisely. And in, in, in uh, Aristotle also mentions that the end of medicine is health. But again, medicine, who has this particular end, uh, is subordinate to a superior craft, which is politics, which this defines how, when, uh, to what extent, in the same way as with ships, as with victories, or with wealth, uh, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. So, and that, that, that's the very first chapter of the Nicomachean Ethics. I mean, something like a premise, something like um, something that is this taken is what for granted. we are talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The, the, this is why we're having the discussion in the first place, so to speak. Yeah, yeah and I guess what, what's very, very interesting looking back in ancient Greece is that different cities, what we call cities today, there's no good name for the polis, I guess, right. um, unless you, yeah. you know one. Uh, e even in modern Greek, saying polis um, doesn't cut it because Polis means city right. in modern Greek. Um, you think of something like modern Athens and ancient Ath in, in modern Sparta, but ancient Athens and modern Sparta were more like ways of life than cities in the sense that we know them. They were ways of life encoded in law, defined by different ends. It's almost like... It, Everything from the dressing to the to to how children were raised, to how people conducted themselves, constantly revolved around the center, in and every city state defined its own center. For the Spartans, it was victory in war, as as we hear in Plato's Laws. Uh, for the Athenians, perhaps it was. Um, what uh, Pericles uh, said in the funeral oration, he said, we Athenians, um, it sounds very funny in modern Greek because it contains the word malakia, <laughs> which is a swear word, but he said, philokalumen uh, metephtelias ke philosophumen anef malakias. We love beauty in simplicity, perhaps, and we philosophize without becoming soft, although the modern 
uh, meaning of the term is is also valid. Um, so it's a di different thing. The, the, a Spartan would say, we are Spartans because we live a life that leads us to victory in war. A, an Athenian would say, we are Athenians because we live a life whereby we can philokalumen, metaphthalias, love beauty and simplicity and philosophize without becoming soft. These are different ends and these were decided by the Spartans and Athenians respectively, correct? Yes, 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 you're absolutely right. And uh, in Pericles' funeral oration, which you mentioned, uh, one of the great achievements of Athenian democracy, according to Pericles, is this fine balance between private interest and uh, public involvement. So uh, the Athenians, uh, Pericles uh, says, are able to do their own business at the same time uh, uh, doing the business of the polis. So uh, the, the, the public and the private are uh, standing in equilibrium and uh, those people uh, who do not engage in uh, public debates or do not uh, engage in voting in the assembly are supposed to be useless as citizens. So yes, uh, and, and also uh, the, the fact that the democracy back then was direct meant that every single decision day by day was taken by the whole um, uh, body politic by the whole um, citizen body not uh, the, the, there was no kind of uh, giving over the power to some representatives for for a limited uh, uh, period of time but it was uh, each and every citizen was responsible for their um, decisions every, and, and uh, the person who did not engage uh, that's where the the word idiot comes from because Idiotis in Greek, both ancient and modern, means private, a private individual. Uh, but the the English idiot, which comes from the same word, has retained some perhaps of the original ancient Greek meaning, whereby if you are just a private individual and quote unquote mind your own business, you're a bit of an idiot because someone is going to be ruling over you, whether you choose them or not. So you better choose them. I mean, it's not like you can live in a state, kind of a stateless society with no rulers. You are going to have rulers, and in a in 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 a society where you can actually choose them directly, like that of ancient Athens, you would be an idiot if you refrained from doing so. Yeah. Okay. This this is um, uh, if 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 I may, this is a kind of standard. Uh, it seems to me misunderstanding. Uh, Idiotis in ancient Greek doesn't mean idiot. Uh, it's it's it, it's a term which is uh, hard to define because basically it's a negative term in the sense that idiotis is the one who is not what the other term designates. So if you say idiotis and uh, poetis, uh, then idiotis means one who is not a poet. If you say idiotis and polis, you mean the individual as opposed to the collective uh, city-state. If you say idiotis and um, uh, physician, then idiotis means the one who is not a, a medical doctor. So uh, basically it's a negative concept, so to, to be an idiotis uh, means or might mean that uh, you are not an active. You're uh, nothing active. Uh, you're not a citizen. You're uh, not a right. doctor. That, you're not uh, an engineer. Okay. You're not that, an artist. Right. You, yeah, you, yeah, you're yeah. just a person hanging in the balance. Right, right. And it, 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 so it was in this context, it's good that we set out the context because it was in this context that the Greek philosophers tried to reason about what's the best way of governance, but that, as we said, was not just management of a given situation, it was defining the situation, defining the goals, defining the end. So the ancient political philosopher had a much harder job than the modern, because the modern political philosopher takes liberal democracy as a given. There, there are no, not too many political philosophers today who uh, propose a return to a feudal system of the Middle Ages, although some might say that we're heading this way either, either way. Um, but you don't have many, many proper 
academics such as yourself in academia teaching about uh, you know how we should return to ancient rome or ancient they take liberal democracy for granted they take the idea that humanity has somehow arrived at this best of all states whereby the ultimate goal of the state is to promote individual freedom and it's on that premise that assumption that they philosophize but that of course is a much more restricted philosophy because it's a philosophy of managing a given goal is a bureaucratic type of philosophy but for plato for aristotle the goal the end was up for grabs and the ancient city-states each gave a different answer so Aristotle, when he wrote his politics, had the example and the experience of many, many city-states, each of which kind of gave an answer to the age-old question, what's the ultimate goal in life? Athens gave one, Sparta gave one, and Aristotle had this vast data set, to use a modern term, to define his politics. And it's in that context that Plato wrote the Republic and philosophized about the role of medicine in this republic which is what we're here to talk about and just before passing the discussion to you it seems to me that today in this liberal the, the, there is some connection between the rule of doctors that we are experiencing as of the global pandemic and liberal morality what would you say? Um, I would say the following, that um, modern liberal, liberal democracy, the way uh, we experience it, uh, wants to get uh, free of values. Uh, the emphasis on the individual and on, on, on the freedom is indeed a value, but it's, uh, one might say, that it would be the prerequisite or the condition for the growing, uh, for the growth of, of actual values. We have no sense of uh, good and evil, basically, it seems to me. And uh, so, um, to, to, to think of the good life or to, uh, to try to figure that out uh, is something that um, is as, as we said at the beginning, outside the public uh, domain and the, the, the debates. It has become a private that's right. discussion. That's, that's right. So each and every individual has to decide the kind of life that they want to um, conduct, to lead, to attain. And uh, um, within that broad structure, it seems that sheer survival uh, is uh, something that everybody should recognize as, uh, as, as a value. Uh, the survival uh, or, uh, without any um, consideration about the kind of life that, that one uh, will, will um, leave. So uh, the medicalization of, uh, of the politics that we are observing uh, these days, I mean, the fact that uh, the, 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 the medical profession has extreme power in um, promoting uh, particular policies, um, it seems to me stems from the fact that we are in a value-neutral uh, society. And so, uh, survival seems to be something good, and so we pursue it uh, um, at all costs without uh, thinking about side effects or about uh, um, actual. Um, we don't have the discussion about the good life, and all, and and uh, one might say that uh, uh, the continuation of life um, is itself. Um, it has become the ultimate goal. Yeah. Yes, beca because we do see any, in Greece, we almost passed through two phases whereby in 2008, um, when the global financial crisis hit, perhaps we felt it a couple of years later, but we felt it for sure. <laughs> Whoever's Greek on the, in the audience knows that very well. And back then, it was the rule of, um, of the economist 
the 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 economist had taken over politics and now as of the pandemic it's uh, the doctor that who has taken over politics and like you said i like how you brought it into context that um to use ancient greek terms there was a, a word for there were two words for life let's say vios and zoe and from vios in english we take the word biography um which we never call it zoography when someone writes their memoirs they call it a biography because they don't write about their bodily functions they don't write um, necessarily what they had for breakfast five years and 12 days ago they unless that moment was important in the development of who they became so a biography are the events that made you into the person that you are into this unique person that you are, Vios was the life of the free man, the man who chooses and defines and sculpts almost his life, like a sculptor does with a piece of marble. And, and, and actually, actually, this is the image that a later uh, Greek philosopher Plotinus uses about uh, the uh, the sculpture who does uh, the 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 statue is. I mean, the the, the person who improves uh, himself or herself is like the sculptor, uh, the, the the sculptor who does the the the, the statue. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you. no, I, I didn't. <laughs> I, I I was not aware of that. I I, I guess great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> and the other of course was zoe was which was the animal let's say part of us the the bodily functions um which is why we call zoology when we study animals and biography when we study people and now it seems just following what you said and trying to use ancient greek terms in a sense uh, although they shouldn't just be ancient um zoe has taken over vios that's right uh you're absolutely right um Zoe, which 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 is the 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 the, the bare life that uh, Agamben speaks about, uh, or the sheer uh, survival or sheer uh, existence, uh, uh, the biological frame uh, has taken over the truly uh, human life, which is of course um, to a certain extent. Uh, based on on that on that frame, but uh, um, is much more than that. So yeah, you're right that uh, the the life as such, as opposed to life uh, as the good life that human beings should live, has taken over. Yeah, um, and we all we are all witnesses to that kind of consent yes 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 very well said unfortunately a bit too passive as witnesses perhaps and i think the, it, it also fits in the, a larger context of how modernity has come to see the the individual and human nature in purely mechanical terms so if as most people are if one is convinced that all there is to us is a body and that body has a certain complexity, uh, more so in the brain than in other parts. But um, and that complexity gives rise to this strange experience that I'm having right now as being inside of a body. But that is little more than an illusion. Uh, what I really am is just a bunch of neurons stuck together. So if you give that definition, if you accept that definition of the human being, it's no wonder how just preserving this highly complex mass of neurons it becomes the ultimate goal. Correct, yes, because it's the, the, the whole mechanical idea about nature. Not only human nature, but nature as a whole. The, the idea that uh, it's a very complex machine. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I entirely agree. Yes, and that gives rise to um, to the idea of the doctor as almost like a maintenance engineer. He's almost like, you know, if we combine these two things, we said that we live in a very value neutral society and that all there is to us is this complex machine. If you combine that, then, you know, the doctor becomes like a repair mechanic for the 
very heavy quotes, natural wear and tear of a body that is exhausted by pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, as you said, I mean, the, I would think that the basic concept is something like technocracy. Uh, in the case when, when a, a pandemic rages, then the technocrat is the physician. Yeah. When a financial crisis erupts, then the specialist, the technocrat, is the economist, and so on and so forth. Uh, without any unified vision about what we want to achieve as a society. And like you said, what is the good life? Yeah. And just for people who, you know, might be wondering where we're going with this and uh, perhaps people who are actually very afraid of uh, this pandemic and they're, they're um, locked at home, listening to Ancient Greece revisited compulsively. Um, you know, just to bring, just to give the counter argument, it's not too long ago that uh, in Greece people said, Eleftheria i thanatos in Greek, give me freedom or give me death, which is a very it's pretty common revolutionary uh, motto. It's it's not Greek in its origin. I think it was from the American Revolution, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but in variants, in very different variations, it exists in a lot of lang languages. And in Greek, it sounded just like I pronounced it. And it was the motto of the Greek Revolution of 1821, uh, that in just a few days, we're going to be celebrating the 200 years the of this revolution ironically at the moment where greece is the most enslaved whether by accident or or by intent i'll, I'll leave that up to the listener but th this motto was more than a motto people lived it during that revolution they gave their life in greece as they did in other parts i, I, I know that mexico had its revolution in 1821 as well although I, I was corrected by a mexican that it wasn't it's a little bit more subtle, but uh, and the United States, of course, had its revolution. People lived this motto, give me freedom or, or give me death, which means that they understood that there are things higher than physical Absolutely. survival. Their, their lives not worth living. Yes, precisely. I mean, freedom, political freedom, in the case of the uh, motto uh, you mentioned, uh, is uh, was, was a value, a value kind of superior to mere survival or physical existence as such. And uh, it seems that um, in most societies, past and, uh, I mean, ancient or, or uh, modern, uh, there have been um, values uh, that are always superior to the value in inverted commas of naked life or sheer existence. Uh, of Zoe. Of, of, yeah. Or, yeah, as far back as the Iliad, bravery, yeah, I, courage, virtue is something that is worth living with or for. And just prolongation of a dishonored life is worse than even death. Mm. And in Sparta, uh, which you mentioned earlier, the Tresandes, the so-called the, the ones who had um, become afraid, who were fearful during a battle, uh, immediately lost their political uh, rights. Uh, they, they, they were allowed to continue the physical the, existence, life, yes. but not the full existence of a Spartan um, citizen, and they were greatly dishonored. So you see, I mean, from the Greeks down to the American Indians of the 19th century, there has always been a value which is superior to um, the value of... Um, of sheer yeah. existence. Yeah. Any other culture, it seems, apart from ours. Yes, that's right, that's right. And one wonders um, how we... Uh, have reached that stage of thinking of survival or physical existence or bare life as the only 
value. I mean, I, I, yes, and that is a question that's burning in my head. And uh, hopefully, through these episodes and having wonderful guests such as yourself, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. But on that note, it, and just to segue just for a moment from medicine and the pandemic, it's very hard to trace the moment where this became so, at least for me. In other words, you know, I've been reading some books that are critical of uh, liberalism. Uh, there's one great book called Why Liberalism Failed. Um, try to put the link below. There's another one called Demon in Democracy. Um, and they all say how it's it's a little bit difficult to trace the roots of liberalism and liberal democracy because it's not one person who came on scene and said, I'm bringing you liberalism. Well, with something like communism, you can trace it back to Karl Marx. Um, but it's not that hard either. You know, the principles of liberalism were stated uh, almost verbatim by a handful of individuals. So you need to do a bit more digging. But it's there. When it comes to this materialism, this this materialist philosophy um, that views the human being as nothing but a bunch of cells put together, essentially, it's for me, it's very hard to trace. Because if you go back to the people who are considered the inaugurators of, of the scientific project, someone like Descartes, you find that they're much more idealists in the philosophical sense than materialists. You know, Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am. So he gave primacy to thinking. Thinking was the only thing he could be sure of. And thinking, I guess, for him meant more something like consciousness. Uh, the images, sensations, feelings, they were all uh, parts of thinking in Descartes' language. Um, so that he, could, he was certain. He was not certain that uh, matter exists even. He said, what if I'm trapped in an illusion, you know, uh, it, in the matrix, we could say today, it would be an excellent metaphor for Descartes. Uh, in what if I'm trapped by a malevolent God was his metaphor, obviously. Um, so matter was, you know, there was a question mark over matter. Uh, mind was the certain thing. Yet today, we live in a totally inverted world where matter is given and mind is kind of questionable. Mind is the illusion. And I can't find the turning point. It, would you have something to help me? Uh, okay, I would, I would think, and this is not a very original thought, I mean, it's quite of, uh, uh, mainstream, that uh, with Descartes, we enter a state uh, uh, um, of dualism or between mind and matter between the res cogitans, the thinking thing, and the res extensa, the extended thing. Now, once this dualism is there, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it does matter, but I mean, uh, once you have the separation of mind from matter, uh, you may think that mind is superior to matter, but then one may turn the scale upside down and say that, uh, no, matter is superior to mind. Mind is a, an epiphenomenon of matter, and that actually happened in the uh, 8th, 19th century, uh, when people uh, thought that uh, the basic thing is matter and the the mental is just something that happens on a material, social and uh, also corporeal uh, conditions. So what I want to say is that to have an idealistic perception um, or to have a materialistic perception are uh, different attitudes but still similar in the sense that they have divided the whole into uh, parts. Now, the ancient Greek uh, perception was that mm, mind and body were different aspects of a single whole. And even 
with Plato, who believes in the immortality of the soul, and uh, or with Aristotle, who thinks that nous, for instance, mind is something that is can be without the body. But but still, I mean, Plato and Aristotle, in in, in that sense, were the great exceptions. Before them, as well as after them, no one ever thought. It, it never occurred to anybody to think that there can be something which is not also material, uh, uh, material as well as uh, spiritual or mental. So there was no separation between um, the extended thing and the thinking thing, but were different aspects of course with great complexity and there were problems about the but but still there was no uh, separation uh, which we uh, have witnessed in modernity and in philosophy this has become uh, has uh, has been initiated with Descartes you mentioned so I think we are still I mean the, the whole problem is how to reunify what has been separated mind and body but the problem the real problem uh, and the real crux of the matter is the separation itself once you begin with two different things then it's hard to reintegrate them it's impossible to to even imagine how the two could be connected uh, the the mind and and in a way perhaps it was more like a historical development um, because i don't know of you know a great philosopher that brought uh, the materialist philosophy, uh, you know, the dualist philosophy, you have someone like Descartes, um, the idealists, you have someone like Berkeley, you, you, but the materialist, I can't remember of one big name. Um, there's a few small names today, small in the context of, you know, the history of philosophy, like uh, someone like, I don't know, Richard Dawkins, perhaps, but I don't know of any w big names. That... What, what about Karl Marx? Correct. 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 <laughs> I mean, I mean, the 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 nineteenth century. Uh, I mean, Karl Marx is the 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 uh, Hegel turned into materialism. Um, so yes. the idealism of Hegel has turned into Marxist materialism, and you do have a great uh, uh, great philosophy, at least to the extent that it has influenced uh, political. Uh, it, it had very very uh, big political consequences. Um, Yes, so. correct, and it's it's perhaps telling that I didn't <laughs> think about this. Uh, it's uh, it yeah, it's very interesting. This this um, how strong Marxism is in our minds because, and the problem there is because Marxism for most of its history was like the minority position. You know, it was well in in Marxist time, it was literally on the fringes just some intellectuals and factory workers. And then, of course, you had the Soviet state and through the Russian Revolution. Uh, but in the West, communism was still suppressed throughout, let's say, in the 50s in the States, you know, the McCarthy uh, doctrine and all that. And I think we still delude ourselves into thinking that Marxism is this kind of uh, undercover, underground current in our society but i think that at least this part without talking uh, in any kind of conspiratorial terms like you know the the march through the institutions without going i think it's it's possible to say that the modern mind the contemporary modern as in late 20th early 21st century has been shaped by marxism to a large degree by by a kind of um, materialism uh, whose perhaps best or more elaborate expression in uh, the social sciences is marxism but uh, it goes uh, beyond uh, marxism it's it's materialism um, the basic thing it seems to me uh, the the idea that whatever else you have like consciousness is something that is built out of material uh, components and is a property ultimately of complex matter.
It's almost like vapor forming on a heated pot, a boiling pot of water. The water is the, the, the substance and uh, there's the heat is the um, the the distortion that you see in heat perhaps is the consciousness it's like a vapory kind of hard to touch but almost certainly a product of the matter is how the That's modern right. mind sees it mm -hmm. so yeah. what, what what we don't have it seems to me is i mean what we do have is the absurd belief that the lower and simpler can generate the higher and more complex. We begin with matter which is devoid of life in any sense and where we end up with a complex, complex life patterns such as human beings or other animals. And uh, it doesn't seem to we, we, do, we do, I mean, this is different from thinking that there is something implicit, life is implicit in matter and becomes explicit in some contexts but not in others. That would be an entirely different thing. Now we think of life, mainstream science, as something that happens over and above, uh, kind of, by yeah, by accident and kind of miraculously miraculously and it's almost like a matter of definition like we see something moving and we say it's alive uh, but it doesn't mean it's anything more than just cogs and wheels inside of it um, and speaking of exactly that there was a moment or at least there's a school of thought that believes that there was a moment of inversion uh, which you can narrow down to exactly what you just said uh, whether the higher defines the lower or the lower the higher. So, for example, in the case of ancient Greece, the individual was defined by the polis. And there's this great twist in Aristotle's politics, where Ar Aristotle says this, and it's interesting because I went through um, almost like Maslow's hierarchy as reading the politics, I kind of fell into every Aristotle's traps. And there are a few, which is the point, I guess, for the ignorant reader to fall into this trap. So I felt into, fell into this trap. So he begins by saying this, Aristotle says, our subject here, you know, uh, the, the work is called politics. So our, our subject here is to understand what is politics, what is the political, and what is the polis, the republic, the city, the city-state. And then he says, strangely, it surprised me, he says, to understand the, the whole, we must understand the parts. So to understand the police, we must understand its parts, the citizens. And there I thought, oh my God, he's like talking like a modern scientist. Where is this holism that I thought was there in ancient philosophy? But then he goes into a stalemate through his own words and he understands that the citizen is in turn defined by the police. So he cannot start by the citizen, by the part, because the part is defined by the whole. Um, women were not citizens in ancient Greek states, um, as children are not citizens today. Slaves were not citizens. Uh, like you just said, the Spartan who was cowardly in battle was not a citizen. So y y the same person, whether he, w he was considered a citizen or not a citizen would, had nothing to do with his, his body and his uniqueness and his material substance. It had to do with how the polis, the city, the republic, saw him and defined him. So then it's almost like tricking, or at least that's one reading of Aristotle at this moment, what, almost like tricking the reader, sucking him into believing that you can understand the whole by virtue of its parts while well, he proves that you can't at least in the case of the polis and that was very prevalent in ancient greece but then it changes in modernity right yes yes sir. that's right and actually um, according to aristotle ethics which is science about the good life in the individual is subordinate to politics which is the science of the good life in the broader context of the polis. 
so, I mean, it is clear that for Aristotle, ethics is subordinate to politics precisely because the whole is prior to its parts. So, uh, yes. But the connection between the individual and the police as society, the organized society, the connection between the two is to be found, and this is something that we are far away from Aristotle, is to be found in nature itself, in the fact that human, humans are by nature social or political animals, mm -hmm. Aristotle says. And this is the connection. Uh, the connection between the part and the whole. It is, Aristotle says that the polis uh, comes about um, or is generated uh, by nature, which, which is quite strange. What does it mm. mean that the polis, the social organization of the Greek city-state, is a natural product? Is it a natural product in the same way that the beehive is a natural product? Is it the same way that the apple is a nat natural product of, th of the apple tree? Not at all. I mean, there has been in human ingenuity involved. I mean, you, you don't have um, the same uh, social organization uh, throughout, and Aristotle thinks, <coughs> excuse me, that um, actually the, 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 the city-state is the optimal, the ideal social organization. So how is it natural? one might ask. Now, Arzold says that it is natural because it is based on natural uh, relationships, namely the relationship between uh, man and woman for the sake of procreation and the relationship between master and slave for the sake of um, uh, well-being. Yeah. And then you get the household and the household is not sufficient. And so if you house Households come together and you get the village. Now, the village is still not sufficient for the good life. So some villages get connected to one another and then you get the city. And this is the perfect, the ideal social setting for the good life. Now, the way in which the city is the product of nature is this. It has come about through human um, ingenuity or human, human uh, um, perception because it is implicit in human nature. Because, in other words, humans want to thrive and the means whereby they can thrive is a social organization such as the police. So, uh, what I want to stress is this emphasis on nature on human nature, which desires things, um, and uh, nature, human nature itself, is able to supply those things, or to, to, to even go beyond, improve what is given by bare nature. Mm. So this is fascinating. So he's almost, Aristotle is almost like saying that, look, there are, you know, there's a part of nature that's biological that it has to do with feeding, sleeping, t taking care of the young. And for these, you have the structures of the household that operate in, in their own rules. And in ancient Greece, you had slaves, master slaves, uh, men had roles, women had roles, children had roles, etc. And that is um, an optimal organization in Aristotle's view to essentially sustain the body and, and make it procreate. And if man was just this, was just his physical body, was just Zoe, um, that would be the end of it. Um, but there's another part, which is, let's say, anagogic. It looks to improve. Its, it, it strives for an ideal. It strives for perfection. And for this, the polis is the perfect conduit. So the, pol the, the polis is natural to the degree that this striving for perfection is natural. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. You are absolutely right. And how does Aristotle define well-being, human well-being? He defines it or he bases, um, he wants to um, 
he wants to, to, to find it out in the specific difference which characterize um, uh, the human species as opposed to other animals. And this um, difference is the presence of language and, um, so to speak, rationality. So if you want to thrive as a human being, not as a mere animal, you want to, you, you have to cultivate that part of your nature which is distinctive, and that part is not the biological part mm. which, which we share with other animals, but the rational part. The and purely human part. Th that's right. So that's why the development of character, ethos, and the development of um, logos uh, are so important. And Aristotle thinks that uh, these developments, the ethical and the intellectual development of a human being, uh, can be best achieved in a Greek, um, in, 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 in a city state, I mean, in, 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 in a polis. Yes, in a, in a city state. Um, but to, today, obviously, we don't live in this. And what I've been noticing is that, you know, um, first of all, it's interesting how you contextualize that, that, you know, um, there is this animal side of us and, and, and there is this purely human side of us. And it's interesting how um, there's one philosopher, Hannah Arendt, um, that uh, begins one of her most important books, The Human Condition, uh, or Vita Activa, it's uh, called either way, uh, by pointing how Aristotle's motto, man is a political animal, was changed, corrupted, some might say, very early on by the Romans, by translating it into social, socialis, so politikon zon in Greek became animalis socialis, social animal, which, like you said, is not distinctive of humans. Penguins are social animals. Um, chimps are social animals. We are social animals. That's not what defines it defines us a definition needs to be exclusive what defines us is the political um, so it's almost like very early on this distinction became blurred right yes that's right and um, um, one might think that although although Aristotle uses the term political in order to characterize uh, animals such as ants or bees uh, uh, what he and and he means basically that they have some kind of social organization uh, he uses this term which is a loaded term uh, uh, to to mean basically the social organization of a Greek polis and although he knows very well the conquest of the East uh, done by Alexander the Great, his uh, disciple, uh, and so he must have thought that there are social organizations well exceeding the limited um, regional and political vision of a Greek city-state, namely empires, the Persian Empire or the, the Alexandrian uh, Empire, he doesn't think that empires are uh, a further development beyond the city-state. He doesn't mention uh, empires at all precisely, and we know that he knew uh, empires, precisely because he thinks that empires uh, are kind of a deterioration of, of life, that, that there's, there's a certain limit to political organization in terms of space and uh, citizen body and things like that. And beyond that, you are lost uh, uh, as uh, a member in a yes. mass. And it's, it's very ir ironic how um, Aristotle uh, was the, the philosopher who, who exalted the Greek city-state and his student, Alexander the Great, was the one who dissolved it. <laughs> That's right. But there's also another irony that uh, Aristotle who exalted the city-state and the citizen, spent most of his life without citizen rights, either in Athens... In exile, <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, either in Athens as a medic, 
or yes. in uh, on on the island of Lesbos or in Asia Minor. So uh, most of his adult life was spent uh, in places where he was he personally was not a citizen. Uh, that that's kind of ironic. Yeah, it's uh, it's ironic. It's like we we spoke about in our interview with Artemis. The you mentioned this uh, Hegelian phrase: "The owl of Minerva flies by night." So we gain knowledge only when we've lost it. Um, and and even if he was uh, an Athenian citizen, because Aristotle uh, was was not an Athenian by birth, so he came to Athens, taught in Athens created the Lyceum, which was the second greatest school uh, after Plato's Academy. And um, but even if he were a Greek citizen, the times of the city states were uh, at their dusk, at their end. So so Greece had suffered from the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, weakened both cities, destroyed Athens, uh, then Sparta was destroyed. So and then Philip conquered Greece be before Alexander uh, turned it turned the kingdom into an empire by conquering Persia. So already the city state was going down when Aristotle came out and wrote so perfectly about it. That's right. That's right. And uh, the same holds true about uh, tragic drama. Aristotle uh, has written excellently in his poetics about the 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 goal, the aim, the scope, uh, and uh, the effect of tragic drama in a period when tragedy is already in decline. And when no uh, tragic great dra drama was being written. That's right, that's right. There were, there were tragic poets around, but they were of much superior, uh, inferior um, caliber mm -hmm. than the, in the previous century. So yes, uh, the owl <laughs> flies, never flies, uh, fly, flies, flies by night. Yeah, late. yeah like, like Aristophanes in, in his play Frogs makes fun of the new of the new uh, tragic poets, even in his days, um, but it's it's interesting how it's not just Aristotle. Um, Aristotle might have thought what Aristotle thought, but history proved him right in that when Alexander conquered Asia and united uh, what was then the known world on that part of the globe, at least, uh, into one great empire, and build this early cosm cosmopolitan globalism, you, you might say. Um, th materially, um, this Hellen Hellenic now world um, thrived and great discoveries in science, case in point, uh, were made. Um, it, the, the Hellenistic technology was very impressive in its mechanical devices and automation even. Um, Aristotle mentions the automatic looms that he dreamt of, but the, Alex the Alexandrian Greeks turned them into a reality. Yet spiritually, you have a decadence that is best expressed in Gnosticism, this tendency that ironically is where I met you from, because you wrote an article on her mistress, Maestus, and Gnosticism, although it's not perhaps what you're most passionate on, um, but this Gnostic, without going in very deep, this Gnostic tendency, this world denying this idea that the world we live in is, is a prison of the flesh, is, is, is a world of pure matter, and our soul strives to leave it for good, this idea that is very basic to Gnosticism, only arose in this relatively wealthy, prosperous, globalist, um, society. Yeah, that's so right. Aristotle was correct in thinking that the the globalized individual is impoverished spiritually. Um, he wasn't wrong in predicting that. And now it seems that we're moving fast into a new globalism. Correct. That's right. I mean, that's that's uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but um, th there's a, the, the globalism of uh, ancient times was a globalism based to a certain extent, a great extent I would say, on Greek values. Of course the setting was a kind of, I mean, was no longer the city-state, but you could see theatres and uh, uh, statues and temples in the Greek manner throughout um, Asia and uh, Egypt and uh, I mean every place that uh, every city that would 
want to be considered cultured and civilized would follow in a way imitate the Greek pattern. The Greek pattern. Uh, so uh, to a certain extent the ideas or the values of the Greek life were transmitted uh, of course in a different um, mm. setting but a modern globalization is or tends to be value free and uh, yes. so it's 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 not a I mean it's not a different idea that I mean a different conception about the good life uh, or it's having it, no no conception. no conception and that's why technology takes the upper hand and I think that technology uh, has a life of its own I'm I'm I I doubt that it is guided or governed or or ruled by any human will. I think that it has a life of its own and this is the life that is imposed on human beings although the products of technology are human products. That's that, this, this kind of frightening thing here. It is a very frightening thing and there are only a handful of philosophers that have dealt with it. I know that Heidegger um, uh, wrote an, a famous essay on this idea that technology has somehow become like an autonomous agent. And and there's a lot of people who talk about, I don't know, uh, the, uh, the internet uh, be becoming self-conscious, self-aware, you know, uh, that perhaps some, again, based on a very materialist understanding of the mind, uh, they say that, you know, if consciousness is just a bunch of interconnected neurons then the internet is this great great brain of the nodes being connected then why not that having a consciousness but i think that we can take it to a deeper level which is i guess the level that you're talking about it doesn't have to be as literal as that it doesn't have to be exactly the becoming aware it's our s spiritual surrender to the momentum of technology Right. Precisely. Precisely. We don't have to think of a kind of a revolution of robots against humanity. That's that, that yes. that's not the issue. That that the machines will get a kind of awareness or consciousness that uh, will end up being tyrants over human uh, species. No, that's not the problem. Uh, as I see it, the problem is that human beings are used to approaching life in the mode of the machine mm. so and so the machine has an influence a very deep and uh, kind of uh, not always um, um, acknowledged influence on the way we contact our lives with schedule um, our days and so on and that influence is it seems to me dangerous precisely because it's not acknowledged as such it's not conscious it's it's considered given like um, ideology works best when it's not even perceived ideology is usually a word we associate with perhaps someone like you, a university professor, or a politician, or a revolutionary, you know, um, Karl Marx had an ideology, Lenin had an ideology, Joe the Plumber perhaps doesn't, but I have found that ideology works best with Joe the Plumber, exactly because he's not aware of it. And this idea that life can be reduced to its mechanical uh, components um, is, is an ideology, is an idea that that came about and has conquered our minds. So I think what you're saying is that once we define who we are in mechanical terms, we will be governed by the mechanical processes that we've set in motion, so to speak. Yes, that's what I meant. And on top of, of that, we may think that um, the great, to come back to the earlier subject about um, the medicalization of health or um, uh, we, we may think that um, we exalt science and uh, we, we think that science is the utmost uh, value. There's nothing wrong, it seems to me, with 
approaching or uh, regarding science as what it is, namely, for most part, a means. What the problem comes, where, where the problem comes, is when not science, but what I would like to call scientism, uh, takes the upper hand, namely, an entire ideology about life which is supposedly based on science, which is not the case. It's not based on science. It's based on the idea of the superiority of science. Yes, and I can't help but uh, interrupt and, and quote something, um, quote something that, I, that I posted online exactly on this. It comes from a book called Death of the Soul uh, by William Barrett who's one of my favorite um, public um, philosophers, you might say, wrote some, some very, very perceptive books. And he says about this, he says, I'm I have it in front of me, I'm just going to read it out. He says, no sooner has science entered the modern world that, than it becomes dogged by its shadow, scientism. What is this peculiar phenomenon we call scientism? It is not science any more than the shadow is identical with the substance of a thing. At most, science merely serves to heat up the imagination of certain minds, and there are not few, who are too prone to sweeping generalizations. Its conclusions are large and therefore sometimes pretend to be philosophical. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly uh, what... Uh, what you quoted yet i have found that in private discussions it's almost impossible to argue with people about any other potential you're still considered a bit of a primitive if you believe um even in the existence of the soul yeah but uh, i think that the problem is uh if i might say so a lack of critical uh philosophy thinking yeah critical thinking uh, because uh, I think, um, well, critical thinking and, and philosophy uh, uh, is something that may be a constant um, questioning of mm. the the things we take for granted, a co constant questioning of what seems to be self evident, mm. uh, of what we take as uh, without um, w hesitation or doubt or whatever. So I think th there has been a tendency to scientify uh, philosophy, to make philosophy another uh, branch of science. But that would be the very death, uh, it seems to me, of philosophy. Philosophy has to be this kind of critical thinking which is courageous enough to question uh, even the most self-evident things and true to, yeah true and I think now it if what we said so far um, is is correct it's no wonder that philosophy in such is in such decline and and dare I say poetry as well and I don't mean that poetically funnily enough I mean there's something about language that is generative um, it creates realities uh, as it's as it lives as it's being spoken and poetry perhaps is the art that goes at the root of this power that mm -hmm. language has and now it feels that we live in this sealed civilization that believes that all the great issues have been answered at least in principle and perhaps we just need to implement a few and again going back to the notion of liberal democracy and um, so we don't live in a very generative civilization yet the contradictions are so evident it it baffles me how people do not see it just on the subject of health and medicine uh, would, that we're talking about there's this strange um contradiction in medicine and the liberal states, whereby you start from a liberal state that says, I'm going to be a managerial state that is going to try and maximize individual liberty. So, you know, the typical motto that you hear is, uh, my freedom ends where yours begin. Okay, 
that and it's roughly how it's it's being understood by the state you know you can do whatever you want with your body um as long as you don't harm other bodies so you can in you know you can smoke for instance you can have sex with whoever however you want as far as 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 long as you don't harm others by you know being an exhibitionist or blow your smoke in their faces um and then as the state progresses it discovers that uh the 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 health care of the individuals that get harmed by various um activities let's say um are going to be paid by the entire society via uh public health care which is integral to the to the new liberal state uh, because it protects it gives the individual health to do their lives as they so please um and then and then a few crises down the line when the state no longer has money then it says you know we're going to ban smoking <laughs> there's too many cancer patients i'm sorry we're going to ban smoking and uh we're going to ban you know free speech as well because well you know it's a hassle just just trying to monitor all these people it's it's the money problem and um, so you end up in a state where you're not allowed to smoke and now you're not allowed to go out uh publicly after nine o'clock at night and before that without wearing a mask so liberalism kind of turns against itself and we need philosophy was supposed to be there to show us why but it's not yeah that's right that's right you know um um i i, I have in mind now Thucydides' description of the plague in Athens and uh, the way he detaches himself from the disease and uh, describes it and describes uh, the way in which the physical symptoms affect the psychology of the people and then uh, they, they have an... an consequences in morals in ethical mm -hmm. behavior and the end of it all according to Thucydides description is a depoliticization of life uh, utter uh, kind of hedonism and individualism uh, mm -hmm. which um, Thucydides um, sees as uh, kind of the ultimate decline or uh, alternatively, the showing off of human nature as it is in itself. In <laughs> in, yes, yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, and we're talking, of course, about the plague uh, that befell Athens in 431, I think, BC, uh, just at the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. So there's this perfect storm back in uh, late fifth century Athens just when Athens is at its height, um, a war begins, uh, or it willfully puts itself inside of this war, actually, and Thucydides was very clear in, in presenting it almost as a natural consequence of power against Sparta, the other pole. Uh, many have compared this, uh, per perhaps simplistically, but still I think there's some value in this comparison to the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union, I guess, being Sparta, the United States, playing the role of Athens. Uh, and just then, a plague breaks out, um, which I think scientists have defined what it was. I don't remember. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but it was very unknown, unprecedented. And a big part of the population of Athens died. Uh, Pericles, the great leader, died. And who knows how the war would have been conducted if he were alive. And... Uh, a big part of the upper class died and uh, yeah just what happened there and then it was a unprecedented um, plague uh, according to Thucydides perhaps uh, the greatest uh, plague recorded in history and um, uh, the, the way, uh, what is striking in Thucydides' narrative is um, that Thucydides himself abstains from speculation uh, that uh, 
he doesn't endorse any kind of explanation uh, about the disease and there were several explanations around one of them uh, was a so-called political explanation people thought that it was a kind of sabotage uh, from uh, the Spartan army that they had uh, poisoned their wells and so wow. the water, yeah. So but how uh, how fitting? Yeah, what's happening I mean, today. There, there were conspiracy theories back then. Uh, <laughs> yes. So Thucydides mentions that without approval or denial. Uh, also, he knows about the religious explanation that some gods, perhaps Apollo, some other god, uh, got angry with the Athenians. And actually we know from sources other than Thucydides that uh, the Athenians uh, uh, sent uh, some delegates to the Delphic Oracle to consult the god about how they should proceed and there were some religious ceremonies that were prescribed and Thucydides mentions the purification of Delos some years later uh, without actually connecting it causally to the plague. Uh, mm. So he doesn't bring in the divine factor and also uh, Thucydides was aware of some medical explanations and uh, it is clear from his vocabulary that he were, was well acquainted with um, Hippocratic medicine and uh, he says that uh, a physician might say about the causes of this disease whatever he pleases. I will just describe the sim symptoms. In these very words, uh, it is clear that Thucydides wants to separate what can be known from what is mere speculation. Religious speculation, political conspiracy speculation, even or scientific. even scientific or medical speculation. And I think that this is um, a very, very subtle balance uh, between uh, what we can or do know and what the admission of our ignorance. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yes, and, uh, and back to Plato, uh, um, who was not as, as uh, cool and, and distant as, as Thucydides. Um, Plato also had some views on medicine uh, as uh, and disease, sickness, medicine, and the role they play within a political society. Um, times and times again through his work, he uses the example of the doctor. And some would say that uh, the medicine becomes like a, a metaphor to speak about politics, right? Um, why is that? How can we unpack it? Yeah, uh, I think I think that um, one, perhaps the basic reason, is that medicine was an organized craft uh, uh, with some with. Um, groups of people practicing it and set rules and of conduct and particular uh, expertise. So uh, that is why um, medicine becomes, so to speak, the prototype of uh, the person who knows um, med uh, who knows uh, in an expert sense something. Who's an expert. Yeah. A, so, a technocrat. Yes. And um, so, so Plato uses the example of medicine in several occasions, um, basically in order to show that um, as there is somebody who is expert in medicine, so we might say there might be uh, or should be somebody who is expert in um, the good life or in politics. But given that we don't have uh, such people, at least uh, easily available, uh, we have to discuss about the political issue. And medicine is just an example um, of what political science or political philosophy uh, should be, in which case medicine would be just a part or, or a, mm. a means within the overall structure 
uh, designed by a political philosopher. So Plato, in a sense, did not believe that you can have uh, a technocracy that will that will uh, mathematically almost prove the good life and 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 impose it. No, and actually, in some in the Phaedrus, for instance, he says that uh, you cannot know the nature of the body without knowing the nature of the soul, and you cannot know the nature of the soul without know, knowing the nature of the whole. And there's some discussion about what the whole means there, but uh, most probably it means uh, perhaps the whole environment. You have to define the human organism as a whole in relation... It is political, perhaps. Yes, yeah. And um, so you have to... I mean, no part is understood on its own. That's the basic idea. And the body, the human body, is a part. So it has yes. to be placed in a wider context in order to be properly understood. Yes, and I think that today we live in this cheap holism because I think, you know, what we've been saying about modern science and how it conquered the mind and, and, and redefined the human organism as, as, as a machine, um, instinctively, many of us try to escape it but without having philosophy which um, like we've said has somewhat declined we do it a little bit clumsy and uh, i see a lot of people who are trying to promote some kind of holism and they will use that word which is a greek word from all on total of the sum and they're usually on the eco uh, side uh, you know the people that talk about sustainable development the people that talk about uh, you know doing a bit of meditation during the day a bit of yoga during the night but they will consistently miss that last part that you mentioned or that Socrates mentions and you very well recounted the political in other words, they'll uh, agree when Socrates says, and I think is one of these dialogues, the uh, Charmidis, um, he says, you must not attempt to cure the eyes without understanding the head. You must not attempt to cure the head without understanding the body. And you must not attempt to cure the body without understanding the soul. Up until then, you know, the modern... Uh, new age holist is fine but there's another step which you mentioned you must not attempt to cure the soul without understanding the polis yes the city state that's right political. that's right but even prior to that uh, the so-called uh, holism first of all it's not a mainstream position if you go to yes. your doctor i mean a medical pr practitioner the family doctor uh, in most cases uh, he or she will approach health and disease in purely mechanical, traditional terms, not in holistic terms. Mm. So, I mean, very, very few people would consider that a physical ailment or a physical disease has psychological um, causes. Mm. I mean, um, physicians tell you that heart attacks occasionally are caused by anxiety. But in st they say, do not be anxious, do not have uh, stress or whatever. But, Which is the worst uh, advice. <laughs> yes, but they give you precise, uh, a precise diet, what you have to, uh, to do or to eat or not to eat. But they don't do a thing about how you are supposed to avoid uh, stress or anxiety and so on, nor do you uh, um, ad advise you to go to a psychologist or psychotherapist. So, for the most part, it seems to me that even this kind of holism is fake, ineffective. Yes. So, the wider context, the context of integrating the body-soul complex within the wider political uh, setting is entirely missing, of course. Yeah, and this is exactly what Socrates tries to do in the Charmides. It's very interesting because, you know, it's not that we're, as a whole, you're absolutely right, you know, the uh, mainstream medicine is me a mechanical science. It, it 
tries to fix the body the way you would fix a car, the engine of a car. Um, but but we're not entirely uh, ignorant of of the psyche, and we have another art called psychology, psychotherapy. But there's something about this that again it misses the point in a very subtle way because it seems to me, and I don't, I might be wrong. I'm just putting the idea out there. The psy psychology is almost like an adaptation mechanism for liberal societies. In other words, it tries to make the individual normal, not exceptional. It tries to make the individual normal, perhaps forgetting then that to be functional in a dysfunctional society is not very healthy. And uh, so it's that idea of the political that you, you sometimes need to grow out of your little box, out of your need to be calm, sleep well, eat well, uh, into try to understand what are the ideas that govern you? What are the ideas that govern your society? What is your stance? What is your take on them? You don't have to like them. Maybe you want to change them. And maybe that is the only way to health. Yes. I, I entirely agree with your statement about the role of psychotherapy in modern liberal societies. It's a kind of domesticization, a kind of taming the human animal in cases. Wow, very well said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and um, because we are, we all live in secular societies, basically, uh, the, the, the role that was played in other societies by religious, by priests or, I mean, religious gurus or whatever, uh, has been taken over by uh, psychotherapy and the ideal is, as you said, the harmonization of the individual with the society uh, without any second thoughts about the values of that society to which the, the individual is asked to adapt. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's incredible. And yeah, I guess, you know, uh, moving towards the future, um, kind of, you know, closing this wonderful discussion, moving towards the future, and playing on this idea of of, um, of medicine, science, to have, having become um, autonomous agents driving humanity towards, quote-unquote, their own ends. Um, there is this idea of transhumanism that's going around, Great, and we had an interview on our main channel, Ancient, Ancient Greece Revisited, uh, with the philosopher Theophanes Tassis, who's uh, an expert in Castoriadis and also uh, has thought a lot about transhumanism. And still, I could not find what I'm looking for, and that is the following, that we might ha have the technology to re-engineer the human organism. I don't doubt, perhaps I don't believe we have it now, but I would not doubt that it's very close on our horizon. Um, what are we going to do with it is the question, because it seems to me that this technology has found us in the most ironic moment where we have no clear ideal towards which to strive. If we gave this technology, if we could time travel, give this technology to ancient Greeks, we kind of know what they would have done. They would have created Apollo, perhaps, you know, the, the, the body in its perfection and the mind open to the music of the spheres, the combination of techno science and, 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 and magic. Uh, but now that we do have this technology, because they didn't have it, we have it, we don't know. We have no idea of good versus evil and all that is left is just to keep on living i think that transhumanism is just going to mutate very quickly into a trans thanatism trans death just keep the whole thing living pumping and that's it <laughs> yeah that's a danger but i would uh i would think that the basic neglect or absence that allows this to happen is again um, 
neglect or absence of a discussion about human nature. Uh, I think that it is because we do not believe that there is a human nature that um, a new kind of technologically improved human being may sooner or later come about. But it seems, and that's a bit optimistic, that in the same way that we have managed to improve, so to speak, commercially, food, uh, vegetables and meat and whatever, and later the trend changed into biological products, namely natural products, mm -hmm. in the future, uh, maybe after transhumans are created, according to specific patterns and programs, the search will be for natural humans. <laughs> <laughs> in the same way that we want now kind of tomatoes and uh, lettuces and whatever without being artificially um, Produ it's, produced. It's, it's, yeah. Again, the owl of Minerva, yeah. we have yeah. to lose it <laughs> in order to find yeah. it. Ju just because before we end, because I'd, I'd like to mention this as well, you are writing a book on the subject of awe. Um, it's a hard word to to pronounce it's literally just sound always an a w e like um wonder on wonder mm -hmm. um just if if you can tell us a, a few things about that and because it seems to me that wonder about life is what can turn this around yeah the basic idea is that the beginning of philosophy according to both plato and aristotle the psychological experience, or if you want, the mood appropriate for the beginning of philosophy, according to both uh, philosophers, is wonder, thavmazin. Mm. And the question is, what does wonder mean? Does it mean something like admiration? Does it mean something like awe? Does it mean, and what is the object of wonder? And uh, well, uh, on closer on close in inspection, uh, what Plato and Aristotle think is that the wandering attitude is an attitude that questions things and wants to find causes, even about normal, ordinary, everyday things. Not about the necessarily the extraordinary or the miracle, yes. So this is a particular, I would say, a mood or uh, uh, a psychological attitude towards life, which an attunement. Is, that's right, an attunement. Heidegger yes, call it, yes. An, an attunement uh, which is inquisitive and at the same time uh, inspired by 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 wonder. Mm, 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 mm. In which I guess you cannot just see life in this mechanical context. It will, uh, what you perceive will always spill over and out of this little box. That's right. Because the question, for the sake of what, would mm -hmm. always erupt, would, would always arise. Um, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. The question of telos. The yes, question, the question of, of the ends. Yeah, 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 the question of yeah. uh, the what is, uh, we, which I find is always there, whether we hide it or not. You know, if if you just follow your own, your own quest, in just a few steps, you'll arrive at the biggest questions. It's what I believe. You know, it's been a wonderful conversation, uh, Spiros. Thank, thank you very much, you Michael. Once again, um, it's one of our best. And I, th I think people are going to have, have enjoyed this very much because it's very current uh, into... Um, I didn't know there were conspiracy theories about uh, uh, viruses being engineered back in ancient Greece, but it seems so. Why not? So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have uh, many more of these in the future. Uh, for now, farewell.